my pleasure to introduce Jeff Rollison uh, from now Pfizer was Quintiles, who's going to talk about, I think, uh, in the field of cancer. Is that right? I work in cancer at the moment, yes. This particular project was in rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, what do I know? Off you go. <laughs> Thanks. So, just to complete the circle, is Pfizer was Quintiles was Pfizer was NHS. That's kind of me in a nutshell, which is probably where most people would like to see me. I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about joint working, uh, about an experience in joint working that, that I had, working initially with Pfizer and subsequently with, with Quintiles. And to the point that was made by the previous speaker just before the coffee break, I don't think I've majored too much on it within the uh, presentation itself, but the joint working process is an extremely onerous process to go through to get the project set up in the first place. So you really are going to want to be incredibly dedicated, motivated and enthusiastic. But the outcomes, I believe, are worth the time and trouble and they're worth all the emotion that gets spent in trying to get there. This was a project not in Wales, in Manchester. It was looking at a rheumatoid arthritis pathway uh, for young people transitioning from paediatric services to adult services. It was agreed between Central Manchester Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust and Pfizer and Quintars were commissioned as the project managers as the kind of delivery vehicle for the project. And I was fortunate enough to be involved pre, during the commissioning stage and also during the delivery stage. I'm going to work through the background, the delivery method, um, pre-project state of the organisation, how the project was actually, how it went through delivery, what the outcomes were, and for me personally, what the lessons were. <coughs> so the background. Central Manchester NHS Foundation Trust is massive. It's a huge site. If anybody's ever visited it, it's a very, very impressive site in the middle of Manchester with several different organisations, several different hospitals, Manchester Royal Infirmary, the Children's Hospital, uh, Eye Hospital, all on the same site, uh, all operating as autonomous uh, agencies and all with their own management board, clinical teams, etc, etc. What we found when we initially talked to them, uh, looking at the joint working agreement, was that within the clinical team, particularly in the adult services side of things, who were the people receiving the kids transitioning through, the service they felt was patchy. Um, there didn't appear to be any formal chain of responsibility and there was no ownership of this transitional process. There was almost no collaboration. Um, they said themselves communications were poor, no protocols, no policies, no procedures for getting them through it at all. And consequently, it was disorganized. And it's worth saying now, at this point, in the pre-project stage, the waiting time for transition was about eight months. The identification of people for transition was entirely in the hands of one clinician who was doing his very best to make the right decisions, but it was kind of a subjective view. There was no criteria, there were no scoring. It was a little bit ad hoc. Some of the observations from staff that we got before to help us populate the PID. You see here, they only had five or six clinics a year. Um, sometimes post-transition, the young people would have to go back to children's services for ongoing monitoring. Uh, the delivery was by goodwill and largely it was done in research time. So the clinics were set up by the consultants themselves and delivered in research time. There was no funded uh, transitional service whatsoever. They had a vulnerable group. They had very high DNA rates because people were quickly becoming disenchanted with the service. There was no fixed location. They had no joint MDT. Basically, if you could think of a way of not doing it right, that was how it was being done. And they recognized it and they wanted to change it. So we developed a project objective with them, quite a simple one, during the life of the project, which was gonna be about 12 months to make transition from pediatric to adult services, a positive experience. And for the patients and their families through establishing a funded and structured transition service. And that's as easy as that, that's what we were aiming for. So the delivery method was joint working. And as I said earlier, there was some pain involved. Joint working, setting up the joint working agreement for this project took almost 18 months. 
And to those who say it needs changing, I'd agree. It does need changing. We, we need to get that sorted. Uh, and I'm glad to hear it's not just the organisations I've had contact with who have those troubles. So I did wonder if it was just me. Good. So Quintiles assisted in the development of the joint working agreement and were commissioned to deliver the service. And project plan, governance structure, all the arrangements around the project were quite firm. They were developed by Quintiles uh, in agreement with the key stakeholders, which was essentially Pfizer and the hospitals that were involved in it. So the tactics for delivering this work. You need high level project sponsorship. It has to be there without that lead from above and a push from above, things will founder. We've found that working with a project manager who's firmly embedded within the NHS organization pays dividends. So for me, I had an honorary contract, I had a badge. If there had been any parking spaces, I would have even had a parking space. <laughs> You need to make sure that the project runs at an appropriate pace and that's not too fast and not too slow and that's kind of always going to be at the speed of the slowest component, unfortunately, which generally speaking, again from my experience both inside and outside the NHS, is going to be the NHS because people have a lot to do, busy agendas, whereas a project manager, in this instance myself, has just the one project for the time that they're there and that's all they need to work on. So there's, those competing agendas didn't exist for me. Whereas for my NHS colleagues, they clearly did. And so we control the speed by controlling the input. We control the input by agreeing it will be something like two days a week for the life of the project. And then that gives people from the NHS time to catch up between visits from the project manager. In a normal um, project management way, work streams are identified, leads are nominated, engaged, get as many people as you can into these projects in the first instance. Try to think of as wide a straight stakeholder group as you can and then go a bit further out than that would be my advice because the last thing you want to do is after six months be going to somebody in finance or information saying I need this, this, this and this and they say well why? Why should I do that? Cut that off at the very beginning. We've always gone down the line of one-to-one -one interviews with staff because you can get a lot of really rich information if you can talk to people alone. When they're in a peer group, in a workshop, or in a focus group, sometimes hierarchies have an impact. And I would say that in this context, one-to-one -one interviews, we found that talking to admin staff, clerks, porters, you get insights from those groups of people that you don't necessarily get from the clinicians and the management. And we use broad, uh, workshops to broaden engagement and obviously we always look for patient, uh, patient views, which we did in this instance. And I think one thing I did want to say was that what's really important from the NHS point of view is they have to be, they have to be prepared to be honest about what's going on in their service. They have to be prepared to own their own problems if you're going to be able to help them. And they themselves have to be prepared not to try to allocate blame to anyone else and just to move forward. <coughs> so again, just to reiterate, these are the things that we found in the pre-project state. Um, for me, one of the most interesting things was the, the absence of communication, any form of communication links. I recall the nurses from one side of this <laughs> divide saying to me, we never hear from them down there. And then the nurses from the other side of the divide saying, we never hear from them up there, and they are no more than 100 yards apart, which begs the question, why not just walk the 100 yards or 50, meet in the middle, talk to each other? But those systems had never been developed. They were separate organisations that had been brought into a site and had continued to be separate organisations. This isn't tremendously clear. I'll just point to a couple of things on here. Um, so there, this bit funded paediatric service, decision made, suitable for transition, if no, back to paediatrics, if yes, eight to nine month wait for service. Here, this could be as long as it took. There was no structure, uh, there was no coordination, there was no funding, and these are the clinics that were, um, that were delivered in research time. Uh, ultimately, people would move to the funded adult service, but as I've already said, they could well find themselves at their next appointment back in children's services because 
there was no um, there was no actual coordination and no service developed in adult services either. So, project delivery. Establish a project board, schedule meetings, that's really important. If, this, if you know you're going to be there for 12 months, get 12 months worth of project board meetings in everyone's diaries on the first day. Don't do it on an ad hoc basis as you go along because you'll find nobody can be there. Establish the work streams, plan your workshop sessions. If you're going to do workshops and you know you're going to be doing them, plan them in right at the start and get the dates in again. Record all the outputs and use this board to make people accountable for their actions. Record actions and then manage them against those actions. So we had two or three workshops in this project. I can't remember now, it might have been more. Several things were identified as issues. Absence of resources, no MDT, no joint MDT going on whatsoever. Really awful communication. Blurred decision making processes. Patients being lost, really just opting out opting with their feet and just, or voting with their feet and not coming back. There was a huge issue around out of area patients and how they were going to handle them going forward because there, were, there was no contractual arrangement in place for that. And you know, you've got issues like this. Older patients might just get the one transitional appointment in the old service. So this is the honesty that I'm talking about and enabling this honesty to, to occur. We looked at readiness indicators, we built a, a set of criteria, and when I say we, I mean they did. All I did was sit there and facilitate the group meetings and facilitate the workshops. I always say to people that we work with, I'm not a subject matter expert, I work in oncology now. I know a little more about oncology than I knew about rheumatology. That's not my job. My job is to help people think. My job is to help people change the way they think. and. As much as anything, the strength that we bring in these circumstances is that headspace <coughs> to just get things going a little bit. And they acknowledged the need for a joint approach. We developed the next steps. I'll just put this, there are a couple of these. I, I gave one of the early workshops, I said, can you draw what you think your pathway should look like? And I clearly wasn't clear enough about it because that's what they actually did. They, uh, both groups uh, drew pictures. Um, I won't go through these now because we've got limited time, but there is actually a logical flow in there that, that kind of stands up and is probably reflected in the work that we did later on. So in terms of project delivery, these are all the component parts of project delivery that I like to use and that have worked for me. And they kind of worked in Manchester because what we got to was a four-stage transition process. So we moved away from that really uh, truncated process that they had previously. It's structured, they developed a joint MDT, they have formalised clinic arrangements and actually one of the good things, there were really good things if, from my perspective was clinics arranged at a time to suit the patients. So for adolescents rather than during the day when they're at school or college, think about doing them in the evening or late afternoon at least. And you know this was, this all came out from the team, not from us. We don't go along and say why don't you do this or this. We just help that thought process to take place. So remember in this vision, this is the first stage of the transition process and I'll just quickly read them because I know it's difficult. So we're looking at group sessions and a buddy system, parent and carer specific sessions to start talking about transition and this is a, a kind of <coughs> preparation stage which is really important for parents as I'm sure you'll all know. Um, because they're going to have to start letting go of their child at some point and not attending every appointment with the kid and, and so on and so on. And, you know, being seen in adult, adolescent services at this stage still, so this is 11 to 13 years, 14 to 16 years, beginning to be assessed to see whether they are suitable. If not, just continuing to kind of circle in a holding pattern in adolescence. But if they are, then you know, they, their case goes to the MDT, and if the MDT agrees that they're ready to go forward, then they transition. And these, these age boundaries, these were kind of time to coincide with other life changes, move into high school, thinking about getting involved in GCSEs, and so on. So then you've got the, the young service, the young adult service, so they've been handed over here. Potentially they might be referred here to other services. 
combined MDTs going on. There's a service in Manchester called Roommates, which is a, again, it's kind of a buddy system for people to, to, to be with other people with a similar condition to themselves. Young adult clinics, specifically young adult clinics. So they aren't going just to adult services all of a sudden. They're in a, a service that still caters for them and their peer group. So again, it's a really nice way of doing it. <coughs> and AHP clinics, so not just always with the consultant, but also with other members of the team. So, the lessons. For me, it's all about engagement. It's all about, what does a yellow flag mean? Okay, thank you. Um, could have been a red card, could have been worse. Uh, <laughs> is that next? Okay. Patience, resourcing, you know, as the project manager and as the, as the, the pharma company working on the project, be prepared to be patient. Be prepared to spend time bringing people along with you. Be realistic about what's achievable and again, be adaptable. And I think project management, you know, those soft skills are really important because it's not all about knowing how to set up a spreadsheet or how to, you know, minute meetings or how to draw a Gantt chart. It's as much of that, if for me, more actually, because I can't do any of those things. It's more about this keeping people involved, keeping them moving forward, keeping the enthusiasm that they had at the very start running all the way through the project. And I think that's me. Very good. Perfect Thank timing. Um, that was a, a little while ago. Is that still going? Is it? So was it sustainable what you eventually finished up with? Yes, the service, the service has been sustained. They, ha they don't have all the funding yet. Business cases are still being worked on, but most of the changes that they developed during the course of that pro project have actually been implemented. Some of them were easy enough because they were, they were doable within existing resources, mm -hmm. but some of them have been major changes and they and their commissioners are working on a plan now yeah. to, to get everything else into place. I was talking to Sue in the break, and it's about project management, yeah. isn't it? But you say that that means either the mechanics of project management or the social aspects of, of It means both, management. yes. And I think that's one thing industry can provide. You know, we, that's how we run our research programmes, our marketing programmes, and we've got those skills. Yes. That I don't say people in healthcare delivery don't have, but they don't use them in the same structured way that we do. Yeah. So maybe, Rick, that's another thing we should put on the agenda, of informatics and project management as things we can work together on. Um, I had a question. Sorry, yeah. Sort of, yeah. The transferability of, of the model that you developed in Manchester, oh, yeah. and has it been taken up by, by the other units? or The transition model you're talking yeah. about. Is, it, yeah, is yeah. that happening in yes. paediatric to adult in, say, Birmingham or Cardiff? Well, I don't know whether it's happening at any other site, but I do know that it's been used as the exemplar approach for the rest of Manchester. Okay. So they had, as it happened, a transition board as well in the hospital, and they were trying to work up their approach to transition. And this, this kind of approach has been used as the exemplar, and it is what they're, last thing I heard, are rolling out. Is it years. written up as a case study? Um, no, I don't think it ever has been, actually. So Other than there was a submission for a... So what we're doing with these exemplars on December the 7th is trying to get people in Aberystwyth to talk to people in Newport and, and Avratawi and so on about what's happening. So they, and then encouraging people to get that and then go and work there for a few weeks and put it into practice, a bit like you're doing in AstraZeneca. I think that's what we need to do. We need to pick good practice like that and see if we can put it into practice in Wales. But of course that demands that a company's involved. Yes? searching, restrictions, family visits being limited, and all of a sudden children turning 18 and they're just thrown into this adult service. In the children's service they hug, they have family visits every day, phone calls when they like, and they go yeah. to these adult services, especially in secure services, where they're living 24-7. They may get one home visit every three months, yeah. one visit every other week. And for the family, this is also a really difficult transition. Yeah. And what you're saying there about involving people in the families and a time frame where they're transitioning would be really beneficial for people with mental health. Where are you, what, what, where are you from? Are you My name is Sarah. Yeah. I'm, I'm a psychiatric nurse, but um, I'm currently working in recruitment. Right. We recruit nurses in Wales Very for good. Uh, mental health services yeah. across all of Wales and England, actually. 
um, but this is a common problem. And you know, it's really stressful for these 18 year olds going into this service. The levels of distress we see are- So they're neither children nor are they adults in so that sense. from being children to yeah. adults overnight. No yeah, it's, there's that, you created really, that, didn't you? Yeah. There was a really interesting dynamic in Manchester in that the children's services were sort of matriarchal and patriarchal mm -hmm. about the kids, mm -hmm. and this was how they were still referring to them. You know, and, it, and it's understandable, isn't it, because they will have been seeing a lot of them since they were mm -hmm. since they were infants. However, in the pre-project state, as soon as they transitioned, they went into a service which was expecting them to stand on their own two feet, look after their own medication, self-manage. You know, so it was a total in a different services, mindset. Things are managed with hugs. They're yeah. managed like, almost like that matriarchal patriarchal relationship. In adult services, it's considered almost abusive. Yeah, 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 yeah. Adults, yeah, you know, yeah. Um, and they cross that boundary. We're trying to explain to an 18 year old who's just come, missing their mum, not able to phone home, just been searched and their belongings taken off them, and then tell them, sorry, it's inappropriate to hug right now. Uh, you get left with this quivering wreck who's yeah. thrown him. They've come from being the oldest in their service to the youngest in very the youth service, and it's very intimidating. So something like this, where they could be introduced to an adult service and the rules of it and the environment, could be really, really helpful. So that's what we have to do. Think, how do we take best practice like that and apply it not just in Wales but elsewhere? And how does industry get involved in that? Jeff, thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Good. Good. Thanks.